I'm Captain Kirk. Fascinating. <laughs> well, I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Thank you, thank you. Love you. Mwah. Most illogical. I saw. Well, that was different. Yep, rousy, but different. Places, please. And here we go. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, bears, catulons, and things to episode Ooh. 76 of the Muppet Trek Podcast. I'm Jarman. And I'm Steve. We're here to compare, contrast, and confer about our two favorite franchises. Jarman, what are those? Those are the Muppets and Star Trek, and we do one-to-one reviews of the Muppet Show and Star Trek, the original series. And this week, we have special Muppet Show guests, Shields and Yarnell, a duo in Star Trek, the original series episode, The Way to Eden. And please, dear God, Steve, give us some context for who the hell these special guests, Shields and Yarnell, are. Yeah. So if you haven't heard of them, I wouldn't don't don't hurt, you know, beat yourself up too bad. <laughs> uh, Robert Shields, at 18 years old, was performing as a street mime in Hollywood. Wow. He got discovered by Marcel Marceau, the famous French mime, given a full scholarship to the School of Mime in Paris, which he went to. But then he dropped out and he ditched and moved to San Francisco. And was like performing on the street there and doing like small time theater performances when they somehow hit it big, I guess. Uh, and but he is credited with being the originator of the robot. Oh, wow. The robot dance. Uh, later on in his career, though, he went on to be the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus's director of clowning. Hmm. Uh, Lorene Yarnell, dancer, and, and she performed in some big musicals like Bye Bye Birdie and on the Carol Burnett show. Uh, she met Shields in San Francisco, and that's where they started performing together. Uh, they actually had their own variety show on CBS, the Shields and Yarnell show. Wow. I cannot find much information about it. <laughs> Never heard of it. But what are they up to this week on The Muppet Show? Backstage, Fozzie is learning how to mime. He climbs stairs and rides an escalator, but Kermit encourages him to be more original. So he starts practicing an act. He gets some feedback from, from uh, Lloyd uh, about him feeding an elephant spaghetti. He then goes out on the stage and does that later. It's something. <laughs> on stage, Kermit introduces some zany birds singing Take a Chance by ABBA. They sing as they bounce on power lines. Uh, Kermit then introduces Shields and Yarnell, who performed Robots Having Breakfast. And you watch Robots Having Breakfast. It's kooky. Up next, we get a King Kong-like ape climbing a skyscraper. He performs kind of a melancholy song, It's Lonely at the Top, as people in the windows sing and play instruments beneath him. We then find ourselves in the Wild West with Shields and Yarnell as cowboys with Beauregard behind the bar. They're sort of caricatures of cowboys, and they play cards and end up shooting each other. Yeah. Yep. Up next, we get some weird blue and green creatures uh, who each play a single note. They perform Little Brown Jug, which is a song you've at least heard. Uh, Muppet Wiki refers to these guys as the Snurfs. Yeah, I, I saw know. that. I was like, I never heard of that before. Vazi <laughs> uh, then hits the stage trying his new mime act. It falls short when Statler and Waldorf start to heckle him. And Fozzie finally uh, pretends to feed an elephant spaghetti and then being choked by that elephant. Mm-hmm. Kermit introduces Shields and Yarnell one last time, who come out on a circus kind of set. They perform Make Them Laugh, joined by circus audience members. Uh, they do various animal impressions, including a gorilla, a lizard, and a few others. Yarnell then gets to show off some tap dancing, which is kind of a highlight. Uh, and she's joined on drums by Animal for that. Kermit thanks Shield and Yarnell, uh, who want to thank Fozzie for teaching them his new elephant bit. And that is what we call The Muppet Show. So, Jarman, what did you think of this week's episode with Shields and Yarnell? I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I thought they were really great performers. They fit the Muppet Show really well as far as their um, their shtick. You know, I, it's I, it's kind of interesting when different kind of performers come on that aren't necessarily just famous people, but people who are artists in the same alley as puppeteering and that kind of or puppets. You know, um, and so I think it fits really well. I mean, in that same vein, I certainly enjoyed these guys more than Mum and Shots. Mum and Shots was like almost like too weird, you know. It's yeah. like these guys was, were more approachable. Yeah, and they actually I was afraid they weren't gonna talk the whole episode, but then they did, and I was like, okay, cool. It's a little more relaxed. They aren't taking themselves that seriously. Right. But their robot stuff was really impressive. Um, and then the dancing at the end was really great. Um, I was wondering if why there wasn't maybe a warning ahead of this episode too, because I could have well, especially my girlfriend was saying, like my fiance, she was saying, was was she in blackface for that cowboy number? It kind of like or no, at least brown face. Like, 
not even. I think she was just like doing like dirty mustache. That's what I was thinking that she just looked filthy really minor. dirty. She had the back, the pulled back cap like she was a minor. That's how I read it. Ah, uh, the minor thing might be a good way of interpreting it. Yeah, like the yeah, soot, yeah. soot in her face kind of thing. It was it was weird. Um, but she made some crazy faces. She didn't, she did not care about looking attractive throughout this whole episode. She like put her hands in her mouth and pulled her you know, teeth out and like that is just so she put was really lipstick funny. across her face. Oh yeah, it was it was amusing. And then I mean I was missing the regular segments. We didn't have many of those if at all. Um, but the Muppet we only didn't numbers really have any. were really kind of cool. Like the King Kong thing was very different. The uh, birds on the on the wires was very different. It was um, a good effect. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's actually pretty high on my list for this season so far. But what about you? I think they so I agree. Cool guests. They fit the Muppets. Um, I think that they could have interacted with the Muppets a little bit more. Hmm. That's how we gauge a lot of our other. Um Actors and their whole their whole bit is being like disconnected or being these robots or kind of playing around so it's hard to tell how they connected that's true because they could have maybe incorporated them more like in the muppets or the uh, robot breakfast segment um right just anything they could have been like, more involved had, yeah that's true robot breakfast which was just them we had the gunfighter thing which was also basically just them plus beauregard and beauregard didn't really interact interact with them i guess a little yeah that's true though they could have interacted. they were just more. doing their own shtick which is fine we've seen performers do that and be very successful but you know, maybe just a little bit more integrated. I could see that. But yeah, but no, not a single regular sketch this week. Not uh, a single that was, one. And that was felt. It was like uh, a little lacking there. So, yeah, man, you get those two as robots in the Swedish chef's kitchen. How is that not comedy? Gold? That'd be great. They How is that, like that not comedy gold? Or like they are in the, the operating room for veterinarian hospital. Or right, right there. He's on the table or butts and honeydew for, creates robots. Like, Get to do a bunch of robot jokes. Yeah, you get a uh, bunch of beaker, put a guy in a box as like a normal guy. He comes out as a robot. Today we've made some robot humans. <laughs> That'd be great. Me, me, me. They could have done that so easily. We just wrote the episode right. for it. We just wrote a stellar episode to show. Pigs in space. Now. They go to a planet. Boom. Robots. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's robots. robots. The whole episode. Robots. <laughs> and she tap dances at the end. For some reason. Um. So uh, I would say middling episode okay, for me. I understand that. Mine's gone down from our discussion. I think it's makes more sense. I'm bringing it down in my mind a little bit. Yeah, let's take it down. Nash. <laughs> we have a lot more. No, we don't know who that is. Guest this season. So. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah. uh, music this week. Take a chance on me. This was a huge contemporary hit at the time. It was released in January of 1978. And this episode went into production in 1979. So this is it was at the height of its popularity. It's Lonely at the Top. This is actually a Randy Newman song from his album, Sail Away. On this album is also You Can Leave Your Hat On, which I also had no idea was a Randy Newman song. Neither did I. You can leave your hat on. It's Lonely at the Top. Don't come up here because it's Lonely at the Top. Um, uh, Little Brown Jug from the late 1860s. It was written by Joseph Eastburn Winner, originally a popular drinking song. It didn't actually hit the height of its popularity until the prohibitions mm. sometime later. Uh, Make Him Laugh from 1952 MGM musical Singing in the Rain. This is sort of considered the pinnacle of physical comedy for, with performer Donald O'Connor, though only 27 years old, was apparently like a multi pack a day chain smoker. Oh, God. And after filming it, he rumor is that he was bedridden for a few days. <laughs> it is amazing to watch. <laughs> Just amazing to watch. If you haven't find it on YouTube, make him laugh. It's spectacular. Uh, so, Jeremy, what did you think was the best Muppeteering moment this week? I know it may seem minor, but I'm going to go with the green birds singing the take a chance on me on the phone wires because that was really well done and timed out. And it was a cool effect too. a cool effect because they had to be in black, I guess, behind them or something. And so, yep. yeah, that was my favorite puppeteering moment. What about you? Uh, I'm going to give it to f to Frank Oz performing Fozzie, pretending to perform bad mime <laughs> and then pretending to perform a bad mime performing being choked by an elephant. <laughs> that does take I think talent. All of those layers on top of it are what just it made it extra impressive. For That's me. funny, but true. <laughs> uh, so, Darren, what happened on this week's episode of Star Trek: The Original Series? So, this episode we have the way to Eden. 
The episode starts off right in the middle of the action. The Enterprise is chasing a stolen space cruiser, the Aurora. It's going in the direction of Romulan space, though, so the Enterprise has to intervene, and they try to take it in with a tractor beam. But the Aurora struggles against it and starts overheating its engines, and the Enterprise is able to beam its crew aboard just as it explodes. So they find a group of space hippies aboard. We have Tongo Rad, the son of the Catalan ambassador who is among them. So they have to be careful with them. They can't just throw them in jail because an important ambassador's son is among them. And what a name, Tongo Rad, I'm just going to say. <laughs> then among them also is Dr. Severin. This re- used to be respected doctor, but now they're all in these space hippie garb. And he tells Kirk that they were headed to the planet Eden, which Kirk says is only a myth. But they insist that Kirk take them to this planet Eden. And he sends the- Kirk sends them all to sickbay to get checked out. But they end up liking Spock as well because he seems to know the customs and the slang of their weird far out social movement because they're all talking like a bunch of hippies and Spock seems to know how to do that and slip right into their DMs. So after they're all checked out by Bones, they are all healthy except their leader, Dr. Severin, who apparently is a carrier for some kind of rare bacteria that most of people in Starfleet and um, advanced civilizations already have vaccinations for. But if he goes to a backward planet like Eden or some other planet where they're not that high in technology, they could all be killed by his bacteria that he's carrying. But Dr. Severin insists that it's just the artificial air he's been breathing all these years on spaceships and space stations. And that's the problem, man. If he just gets this totally healthy air of Eden planet, it'll cleanse him of all his bacteria. Sounds like a conspiracy theorist in modern day COVID society. Or they quarantine him to the brig and Spock talks to him trying to see if he can see reason. But he comes to the conclusion that Dr. Severin is actually completely insane. Um, and then the rest of the Severin space hippies, in the meantime, decide to take over the ship. And they do so by putting on a concert of cool space hippie music to distract the crew and then start heading to planet Eden when they take over the ship. And during all of this, one of the space hippies is a woman that Chekhov used to be in love with. And so she bamboozles him enough to where he tells her everything they need to know to take over the ship because Chekhov just has a moment of stupidity. But uh, once they get to the planet, Severin sends out some kind of sonic burst over the intercoms and it knocks out most of the crew. But Kirk and Spock regain consciousness just in time to find that Severin and his space hippies have beamed down to the planet Eden below. So Kirk is also in Romulan space, so they got to get out of there quietly and they got to get out of there fast. Um, Kirk, Spock and Bones and Chekhov all beam down to find the plant life on the planet. All the plant life is covered in acid and it's deadly to humans. Um, and one of the hippies already ate the fruit and died instantly. And his name was Adam. And the you know sim- symbolism is thick and heavy. So they find the rest of them by a shuttlecraft that they had used, and they all have severe burns all over them from the acid because they're all barefoot and stupid. Um, and Severin won't listen to reason, and he runs and tries to eat a fruit, and he quickly dies. So they all go back to the ship, and Spock tells them to keep looking for their Eden or create it somewhere else. Keep up that hope. And he unleashes these dumbass hippies back into the unsuspecting universe with no punishment God whatsoever. Damn hippies. <laughs> so, Stephen, what do you think of this episode? All right. So some things I liked. This had the best singing in any Star Trek episode we've seen. Yeah. Uh, I loved the idea of space hippies. And I loved even more that Spock was able to decode their entire BS way of speaking in about 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Like that was the joke is he was like, he understood their linguistics enough that he literally just stepped into them. <laughs> and they were cool. With um, it. <laughs> we see, we get to see a snapshot of a much more racially diverse crew than normal. Uh, specifically when they're at the trick concert that the hippies play, mm. it's there's, you know, there's an Asian crew member and some African American crew members and all different units. Like you get a, a much different snapshot than you normally get. That's pretty cool. There are a lot of extras. Um, things I maybe struggled with. A lot. Uh, oh, the thing like we got to see Spock play his heart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> things I struggled with. Uh, Chekhov's connection to the woman was really tenuous. And mm. it was clearly it was supposed to be like a him featured episode. But all it became was this MacGuffin of how they got control of the ship. Because he gave away the information. Yeah. Right. They just I feel like they didn't spend enough time with it to for it to be like Chekhov's story. Makes sense. Um, Man having a frequency that can knock out humanoids on the ship at your discretion sure would have been great a few other times, huh? <laughs> Only Dr. Severin knew this though, because of his specialty. I yeah, guess. I know acoustics and that crap, but yeah. still come on. <laughs> um, and I didn't necessarily like that. The 
end moral really was hippies follow madmen and false prophets who will lead them to ruin. But still try to find your Eden. Just maybe don't follow those false prophets, I guess. Is the right, message. I guess. I right. Guess? So I think that message was like, uh, this was OK for a while. <laughs> Uh, but overall, I guess kind of a middle episode. Okay. It didn't it what didn't blow me away, but I didn't hate it. I think the reason I liked it more than I remember liking it is because now with this watch through, you and I have both seen so many repetitive themes in these episodes, and this one was over very and different. Over and over. Yeah, like there's That's true. This was a weird one. This was very different, very more down to earth. There's not some all powerful being. There's not if a, anything, this was like space seed. Kind of. Yeah. It took in like a different kind of group of people, a different kind of way of life that's not Starfleet, but also not a supercomputer that Kirk has to confuse to blow up. Like it was just very different. I like that it was a different change of pace. And even though they're doing very silly things, I thought the acting was really good. That guy, Charles Napier, who plays the singer Adam in the mm-hmm. episode, he went on to be in tons of movies. Um, you probably recognize him out, out of that costume because he always plays like a general or a colonel. A lot of military men, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and he later on plays in an episode of um, Deep Space Nine as, as one of the military guys that discovers the um, little green men in the 1940s. It's a good episode. Um, nice. But yeah, overall, it's, I think I liked it a lot more than I remember because I also they're very prescient about when he's like, you're infringing on my rights by making me not infect other people. Remember he said you're infringing on my rights. Yeah, like, man. That sounds like anti-vaccination people these days. Man. <laughs> like, it was crazy. So- Oh, so timely, Star Trek. That, that hit so hard, timely. hit close to home. Um, so yeah, I think that's why I think it pushes past a little bit more than middling for me. But yeah, not wonderful, but like I think it stands above a lot of the other ones because it's finally a little bit different. Like it's not the same old crap rehashed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and all oh, they mentioned the singing. I was listening on my headphones because my fiance was asleep, and I could hear the quality of the singing was so good because it's the remastered version on on Paramount Plus. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was like crystal clear, the recording. I was like, wow, this is recorded well. <laughs> but also it was it was too well recorded because it sounded out of place in the scene. It, right, it sounded too crisp. Right, exactly. But anyways, uh, so some trivia for this episode. Um, the yeah. Space Hippies use this protest. Herbert, Herbert, Herbert. Herbert. They call everybody yeah. Herbert if they're like, you know, lame. And this is a gag referring to both Star Trek four-time director Herb Wallerstein and longtime executive in charge of production Herbert F. Solo, who's always in the credits. Um, and it's because <laughs> in this box says in the episode, Herbert was a minor official notorious for his rigid and limited patterns of thought. So they're basically like ribbing their executive producer very much. Nice. Um, and James Dewan, who plays Scotty stated that this was his least favorite episode of the whole series, <laughs> but he was wow. a military guy, but that's why he was like, I don't like these space hippies on my ship. Uh, and Walter Koenig, who plays Chekhov was highly critical of the writing for this episode. Um, you might have felt that with Steven's comment earlier talking about him and the relationship with the woman. He says, in particular, he felt Chekhov was written as too authoritative, rigid, and by the book, a complete contrast from his usual and intended characterization. So right. I didn't get that too much. But you're right. There was kind of just like throwaway relationship just, between the two. Right, it just turned into like a MacGuffin for how they get the ship. And another reason why that might have felt weird because this episode was originally entitled Joanna and the character of Arena, who he falls in love with, who he was in love with was originally to be Joanna McCoy, the daughter of Dr. McCoy, and a love interest for Captain Kirk. But that original oh. script was rejected. And the character of Joanna oh. was planned to later appear in the fourth season, but Star Trek was canceled at the end of the third season, so it never happened. Okay. Um, and I don't think we ever got a Joanna McCoy in later canon either. Uh, Dr. Severn is based on Timothy Leary, a controversial psycholog- psychology professor who advocated LSD as a therapeutic drug. People might remember that. It would have worked. <laughs> they could have should have kept trying. Uh, this was the only episode of Star Trek TOS that contained original music with lyrics. And the actor, uh, Charles Napier, helped write some of those songs that he sang. Um, the only other original song from the series to have lyrics was the title song, but they were never recorded for the series because they were written by Gene Roddenberry shortly before cancellation so that he could get half of Alexander Courage's ongoing rights to the theme song because Gene Roddenberry is a little shark. <laughs> so... He just wrote lyrics for it so he could claim that he owned half of the song and it never actually aired. Nice. Uh, yeah. And that's pretty much it for the trivia there. So, Steve, you got some uh, Trek connection, Muppet connections this time? Around? Oh, boy. Kind, of. <laughs> kind um, of. In this episode, Adam was played by Charles Napier, who is a longtime working character actor uh, who you, everyone, as you mentioned, recognizes from something. 
And having him in this episode opened a world of possibilities <laughs> because I could find nothing from Shields and Yarnell to Star Trek. Oh, I could gosh. find nothing. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, okay. Charles Napier uh, d- does a lot of voice work. He was on four episodes of Jumanji, the animated series. Mm. Also playing a voice in the show was Tim Curry, who was in Muppet Treasure Island. Tim, right. (laughs) Uh, He played the voice of Duke Phillips on The Critic, featuring John Lovitz, who did the voice of Calico in the 2001 Cats and Dogs movie. The effects for this film were done by uh, none other than the Jim Henson Creature Shop. (laughs) Wow. Also in The Critic is Christine Cavanaugh, who performed the voice of Babe in the movie Babe, whose creature effects were also done by the Jim Henson Creature Shop. Leah, look at that. <laughs> oh, thank God for Charles Napier. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, but Ugh. these were the same episode, right? We watched it twice. Oh, they're so similar. Maybe three times. Same thing twice in a row. Why did I do that to myself? I mean, yeah, because uh, just like how Spock admired the performance style of the space hippies and wanted to emulate it. So did Fozzie want to emulate the miming styles of Shields uh, and Yarnell. Yeah. Uh, both featured characters acting contrary to their own good. The robots during breakfast when they throw cereal and spill OJ and the hippies trying to get to space Eden, which is made of acid. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, Statler and Waldorf heckle Fozzie, which throws him off completely. Uh, just as the space hippies heckle Kirk, calling him a Herbert, throwing him off his game and making him nervous. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Uh, both feature musical distractions. The space hippies distracting the crew with to hatch their plot with a hippie concert, and the entire Muppet show is a series of musical distractions. <laughs> That's fantastic. Same episode. <laughs> Same episode. Oh, God, what's that? Transporter yeah. malfunction. Oh, no. Transporter malfunction. All right, here's the part of the show where we transport one character from one episode to the other and vice versa. So what you got for us, Steve? Well, I'm up to Treks this week. I'm going to bring over the birds from Take a Chance on Me and replace the space hippies. <laughs> just bouncing around carefree and singing their silly songs and distracting the crew while they take over the ship. That's funny because I did Star Trek to Muppets. The hippies are going to transport over and take the Tanch on Me number. <laughs> Dancing on the lines. Dancing on the it. power lines. <laughs> I'm up to Trek. I'm going to bring over Adam the Musician and replace one of the circus performers in the final sketch. Just let him prance around and play his crazy space guitar <laughs> while Shields, uh, while Yarnell tap dances. Hey, brother. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Muppets of Star Trek. I have Shields and Yarnell transporting over to take the place of Kirk and Spock. So the hippies, they get to the Enterprise thinking they'll be the weird ones to make the captain out of sorts. But they get there and Kirk and Spock are mimes. Literal yeah. mimes. <laughs> I didn't know they were going to be robots. <laughs> this is this is really weird. Weirder than us. <laughs> well, that brings us to the end of episode 76 of the Muppet Trek podcast. Join us next time for the Muppet Show with special guest Diane Cannon. An original series episode, The Cloud Minders. So from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. 